health, social services and public safety. And could I uh, inform members that question 14 has been withdrawn? And I call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Please, Speaker, question number one, please. The Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service has been asked as part of the Department's planning process for 2015 16 to develop a range of savings proposals which could deliver the best possible outcomes under three scenarios 5%, 10%, and 15% reductions. The Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service will be required to risk assess and prioritise savings proposals on the basis of those that minimise the impact on service delivery before submission to my department. Thank you. And I call Mr. Eastwood for a sub uh, Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for, for his answer. Can I ask him, though, does he believe that firefighting and that very much that frontline service should be classed as a frontline service and therefore uh, exempt from any cuts? The, the, the difficulty I face is that in the budget, uh, the, the uh, are the new budget that I've received as a part of the monitoring round in October, and the, has assessed, and the new budget for 15-16 has assessed firefighting, Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue, as a non-frontline service. Now I can understand why he feels that he's great difficulties with that, and indeed I know that those who work for the fire service have a very different view. The problem is that whilst we were awarded an extra 200 million pounds, we also have to find 50 million pounds savings in what are termed non-frontline services. And there's actually a very small proportion of my budget that I can find this 50 million from. Now, if, was a, if, if I was to accept that the fire service is frontline and should not be subject to these reductions, it's extremely difficult to see where we'd find uh, the rest of these savings. And indeed, the executive endorsed uh, this uh, definition as part of the draft 2015-16 budget and it's, uh, the executive believes that the, the fire service should not be res receive the same protection as frontline health and social care elements, mostly delivered, of course, by the five trusts. And this is consistent with the decision taken on other frontline services, such as the police service. Again, I call Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Minister for his answer? And can I ask the Minister uh, what proportion of the fire service costs are staff related? The 83% of the total costs of Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue are staff related, with the other 17% taken up with items such as training uniforms, publicity, equipment, etc. And that makes the decision as to how to achieve these savings even more difficult because obviously um, any form of uh, staff reduction has a commensurate cost. So I do accept that the Fire and Rescue Service have difficulties with this. Indeed, I'm meeting the Chief Executive, or sorry, the Chairman of the Board, uh, Mr. Joe McKee, this afternoon. I've already had discussions with uh, the unions uh, and individual firefighters have approached me about this. I am under no illusion as to how difficult an ask this is for Fire and Rescue. I accept that this is causing them severe problems, and Mr. McKee has made it very clear that some of what we're asking is going to be exceptionally difficult to deliver. I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. I got a free last count, Corla. I was going to break a selection area, Dr. Agra. I thank the Minister for his, uh, his answer so far. Could the Minister tell us if he has met with members of the Fire and Rescue Service and members of the Fire Brigade Union? And if he has, could he detail the outcome of those meetings? Thank you. I, as I mentioned in response to the previous question, I am actually due to meet the, the Chairman of the, the Fire and Rescue Board this afternoon. I have had meetings with uh, union representatives, and I would intend to see other stakeholders in this sector to talk through the various options. Now, there are suggested uh, reductions that can be made in issues such as commercial contracts, temporary promotions, overtime, and through natural wastage. But beyond that, it is difficult at the moment to see how we can take things much further. But the difficulty is, I have to find the £50 million as things stand within my budget. I have only a very limited number of arm's length bodies that I can approach in order to achieve those savings. And unfortunately, Fire and Rescue falls into that category. And this is going to be quite a, a difficult debate uh, uh, and, and discussions between my department and the arm's length bodies over the next three months. 
And I don't want us to underestimate for one minute how difficult this is going to achieve, because other organisations, for like the Public Health Agency, are also involved here in the Northern Ireland <coughs> Social Care Council. So we have great difficulties, but we simply have no other option but to balance the books for 15-16 by finding this £50 million. Pounds. Well, Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister agree that cuts to the fire service would have a more monumentous impact than cuts to most other public services, especially in farms and rural areas, where we have seen too, far too many farm deaths in recent years? What further scope for efficiency does he believe exists within the fire service without touching those vital, life-saving frontline services? I thank the member for her question, and I know she's basing that on her, her uh, understanding of the rural community. The fire service at the moment has a budget of £74 million. And could I assure her that whatever is agreed will be risk assessed to make certain that we don't introduce any form of unsafe service in Northern Ireland? And I suppose the exercise at the moment is to see how far we can take savings without straying into that territory. But I do appreciate that in rural areas, Fire service goes way beyond simply firefighting and vehicle rescue. It goes in, for instance, into the situation for instance, where farm accidents occur with slurry tanks. And therefore, we value enormously that work. But again, I have to keep emphasising we don't want to be here. We don't want to be asking the fire service to make these very significant cuts. And we're going to discuss with them how they can be done while still maintaining public safety. And that's going to be a very difficult balancing act indeed. And I call Mrs. Sandra Overland. Your question to you, please. The health service is facing significant financial pressures. I think I should put that answer line before every answer I'm going to give today. It is therefore important that trusts take appropriate measures to achieve financial break-even. In seeking to deliver this very challenging objective, there is a need to make some changes in domiciliary care spend based on reassessing current needs and reprioritising services. All trusts, including the Northern, are reviewing their domiciliary care provision to ensure the highest priority needs are met within the current resources. Day-to-day -day implementation decisions are taken on the basis of a professional assessment of the individual need and associated risk. For a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Enabling older people to remain in their own home for as long as is safe and possible uh, is logical and saves uh, huge, huge amounts of money, not least to the public purse. Uh, does the Minister not see the major flaws uh, with the current proposals, especially in areas uh, where he's still allowing a totally unfair ban on admissions to many care homes across Northern Ireland? Yeah. Well, first of all, our commitment to the Northern Trust at the moment is to 4,778 Care, care users who receive 48,000 hours of care a week. So I think that is quite a significant input. And indeed, overall in Northern Ireland, we have now 25,330 clients in receipt of domiciliary care services, and that's 5% more than the equivalent period in 2012. So I think the, com and the commitment is very much there to continue this service. Now, in answer to the specific question asked by the member, during the October monitoring round, um, £8 million more was allocated to transforming your care implementation for 1415. And these monies will support a wide range of measures which will help to meet the care needs of our growing and ageing population. Specifically, as regarding the Northern Trust, I can bring her right up to date uh, that in October 2014, 265 people in her trust area were awaiting full care packages. And 207 were waiting part packages or transfers between providers. And funding has been sourced for all of these packages, and the commissioning process is ongoing. So the issue that she has raised is being dealt with. There is a commitment to, to helping the Northern Trust through the extra allocation. Mr. Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Can the Minister provide an update on the HSC Board review of domiciliary care? As I mentioned earlier, there, there is a review of domiciliary care being carried out right across Northern Ireland, and that has been initiated by the Health and Social Care Board as part of TYC. And I remain committed to TYC, and as, as the member will know, a fundamental part of the, 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 the TYC's recommendations 
is that care should be transferred where possible to the home. The home is the hub. So therefore, the aim of the review is to obtain a better understanding of how the domiciliary care market is currently operating and identify best practice within the various models of delivery in order to shape the future direction and operation of domiciliary care services. Deputy Speaker, would the Minister not recognise that this is yet another attack on the elderly and infirm people uh, coming on the back of the reduction in meals and wheels, and particularly in rural areas, and that what he has proposed not only applies to the Northern but to other trusts, and that it will end up on more of our senior citizens going into hospital, something that we are trying to avoid? And, and I hear what the Honourable Member for, for Strangford says. And yet he is also campaigning against cuts being made in other parts of the budget on the contingency savings. The difficulty is, for instance, if we were to protect Dalriada Hospital, which is in uh, uh, Mrs. Overend's constituency, and sorry, in the Northern Trust, sorry, the Northern Trust, uh, not, not the, the constituency, in the Northern Trust, and we are unable to make the £500,000 savings there. Then the trust then forced to look at other contingencies, and that often means looking again at domiciliary care. This isn't an attack. This isn't an attack on elderly people. This is a very, very undesirable situation that my department finds itself in, having to save £70 million by the end of March out of a very small slice of the budget, because 63% of my budget's staff, wages, salaries, and pensions, and another 12% is contracts which I can't break. So therefore, I am left with a very small proportion of my budget in order to find quite significant savings in a very short period. And one of the, one of the things that can be done is the slowing down of the delivery of domiciliary care packages. Do I like being in this position? Definitely not. Is it counter-strategic? Yes, it is. But we have no other option in the very difficult financial situation we find ourselves in. I've got a few last year on Cordia. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I guess we as Lesh and Ira asked the Fregri, thanks to the Minister too for his uh, responses. Um, one of the, the difficulties that I have encountered in the delivery of domiciliary care packages has been the capacity of some of the private providers to actually deliver. And that's in circumstances where the finance existed, uh, including uh, a recent case of very complex needs where, despite numerous representations to the Trust, they simply could not get anyone in the private sector to, to deliver. Um, has the Minister or his department done any evaluation of the capacity of these private providers to deliver the care packages? The Honourable Member makes a very, uh, in, my, in this case, a very sensible comment. We are experiencing staff shortages in various parts of Northern Ireland. And indeed, a current study has shown that we could be 500 staff short to provide domiciliary care within the next 10 years. And attention has been given to increasing training opportunities to encourage people to come into the domiciliary care market. In most boards, about two-thirds of provision is carried out by private uh, contractors, private firms who provide this on behalf of the trusts. And it is proving it's surprisingly difficult, given the fact that we're in a very difficult recess recession, to attract people into this uh, very essential service. So yes, as part of the review, we're looking at that. I think it's a very important issue. And as the, the, the market, the economy continues to improve, hopefully in the foreseeable future, it's going to become more difficult. So I am not surprised in my own constituency in South Down, particularly at Christmas period and the July holidays, it is proving more and more difficult to get staff to cover shifts. Uh, and therefore, that is an issue that's been taken very seriously by both, both the trusts and the department. And call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Question three, please. As the Honourable Member for North Down knows, I announced on the 28th of November 2014 that I have asked the South East Health and Social Care Trust to ensure that the minor injuries unit at Belfast Community Hospital remains open. I said banger, banger, sorry. I have also asked the Trust to keep, <laughs> keep the Belfast as well. I have also asked the Trust to keep the option of access to beds at the banger site under constant review. The Trust has a range of intermediate care options available, but clearly if additional capacity, if additional capacity is required in the future, reinstating beds in Bangor is one option which could be considered. I also have to say, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, 
that I trust the Assembly will understand that I am mindful that this matter is before the courts, and therefore that limits very considerably what I can say. And I call Mr. Gordon Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. And of course, I would congratulate him on his decision to keep the MIU unit open in Bangor. And I'm glad that ministers do listen and some do take appropriate action. Can the minister, following on from that, can the minister give us an assurance that while the Bangor GP beds are still under review, that the Ulster Hospital will have the necessary resources to meet any uh, rise in demand for such facilities? And it is our main hospital, as he appreciates. And can he give us that assurance, please? As the, as the member is aware, I have allocated £5 million additional funding to address winter pressures in delivering on scheduled care. This money will be used to improve patient flow from emergency departments and expand capacity as required over this winter period. The South Eastern Trust has taken steps to mitigate any potential impact that the temporary closure of the GP wards in Bangor Hospital might have. In addition to improving efficiency and increased community services, the Trust is continuing to closely monitor the impact of the contingency plans. The Trust has been progressing winter plans to improve on scheduled care over the winter period and has started a review of the model of care for older people. The Trust is also working as part of an intricate care partnerships to develop new models of care in line with transforming your care. I'll call Mr Leslie Cree. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his reply. Minister, whilst the decision on the minor injuries unit is um, welcome, it's regrettable that you didn't show the same good judgment with respect to the intermediate care beds. Can you, uh, Minister, explain why you accepted the proposal from the South Eastern Trust in the first place to close the MIU, and when will the 20 bed unit be restored? I hate to sound negative in answering the, the member's very legitimate questions, but has he, as he is aware, very aware, this issue is at the moment before the courts. And anything that I would say on that specific question may be basically used by one side or the other in that particular court debate. So therefore, I'm going to have to, on this occasion, uh, present what would be called in cricketing terms a very straight bat and say that I cannot go any further on that specific question than the answer I've already given. Call Mr. Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister both for his answers and for his decision to keep open the uh, minor injuries unit um, in, in Bangor. Um, could I ask him, because obviously a compelling case was put forward for it, it's, it's meant uh, to maintain it, um, could I ask him? Um, what changed from the initial decision um, to clo close the beds or to close the unit temporarily, and, and his uh, new decision? Um, and again, this is only in relation to the minor injuries unit. Um, I did receive a quite a, a large amount of um, lobbying from members right across North Down on this issue. And one of the issues I took into account was that the midwinter pressures on other hospitals that if we kept the MIU available within Bangor, that could relieve the pressure on other hospitals, for instance, Newton Ards and on the Ulster. And it was for that reason, but I still have to say, make it very clear that the South Eastern Trust still has to find the savings outlined in the contingency plans. So there's still the difficulty of finding the money that would have been saved through the, closure of the temporary closure of the MIU. That has to be found from somewhere. Thank you. And I call Mr. Michael Majimsi. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. Uh, could I thank the member for raising this question because it, it does uh, bring to the four issues which have been mentioned in the, both the media and by other MLAs. The member will be aware from my previous correspondence with the Health Committee that the increasing staffing levels within the HSCB have been commented on by the media and indeed by the committee and are of concern to the department. When our frontline health and social care services are under pressure to identify significant savings, it is imperative that an administrative support given to those services is a subject to the same degree of scrutiny. For this reason, I announced last week that I had asked my permanent secretary 
to conduct a fundamental review of the administrative structures within our health and social care system. A particular focus in this work will be on the relationship and avoidance of duplication between the Department, the Health and Social Care Board, the public health agencies and the Trusts. And I call Mr McJimsey for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, can I also say that uh, I appreciate the review and I have welcomed uh, the review that he intends to bring forward. Uh, but can he uh, accept also that with the Health and Social Care Board in terms of numbers employed has gone from 365 in March 2011 to 525 in March 2014, an increase of 160 people. And I know and he knows that these are pure administrative posts, an increase of around 30%. And bearing in mind the annual budget for the Health and Care Board is about 20 million, 30% of that represents a substantial uh, a, a amount of money. And will the review look very hard at that? And also the issue around the business service organisation, which has similarly put on, in its case, several hundred people uh, again on an administrative side, and that those are issues. Uh, the questions that, brief, uh, please. Uh, require very urgent uh, examination. Uh, thank the member for his supplementary. Could, could I just, for his benefit, read on to the record the whole time equivalents? I think that's the best way to compare like with like. 0809 621, 910 522, 1011 427, 1112 458, 1213 483, and 1314 549. But in that are 80 temporary positions that are in fixed contracts, and once those contracts and work have been carried out, those individuals will be leaving the board's employment. So when you factor in those numbers, it's not as dramatic as it seems. And indeed, the board has kept within it its admin budget throughout the CSR period. And we also have to be fair to the board and say that new, new projects such as Transforming Your Care the integrated care partnerships and other functions have been transferred to the board, new, bit, new work that has to be carried out. But I still accept his, his premise that we need to look at every aspect of administration within the health and social care system. Because already Mr Eastwood has alluded to the very painful decisions that have to be made in the fire service. And we've heard about the stresses of domiciliary care. So it's incumbent that if we're doing that, we also have to make certain that the board is providing the best possible value and we look at every level of administration in order to see if there's any efficiencies that can be made. Though I would say that the, board has, the Health and Social Care Board has accepted a budget which will lead to a delivery of £600,000 savings for the year 1415. And given that the Minister has uh, alluded to the uh, increased administration, costs and indeed I think the complexity of governance within the health system. Could the Minister maybe outline if he intends to bring forward any legislative changes uh, in terms of this review into health and social care? I think that's a very legitimate question. The problem is it's only seven or eight years since we've had the last fundamental review of structures within health. Uh, we've had the reduction from 18 trusts down to five. We've reduced uh, the, the number of boards down to one. We've had the PHA. So we've had that major, major change. Now, I don't know why, whether it's an appropriate time to initiate another major structural change after such a short period. I suppose one of the arguments that could be made is that the present structures haven't really had time to show whether they're an efficient model or not. I think we have to be fair to all concerned. So therefore, whilst I think it's vital that we look into the administrative costs of the board and other organisations, I, think, I don't think the system, particularly with budgets being reduced so dramatically, is, right, is the right time for yet another fundamental review. But I think it's a legitimate question, and I'd want to satisfy myself after the, the Permanent Secretary's report is issued, that all the administration that we have is being well spent, because I'd rather see that money going to the fire service, to the domiciliary care, to the cancer centre, or to, to all sorts of other procedures where there are so many competing demands for that income. Mr George Robinson. Thank you, Mr De Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, would the Minister outline what time frame he envisages for the review of administrative structures? 
Um, we are placing quite a high expectation upon the Permanent Secretary. We would want this, uh, his study to run parallel with the consideration of our final budget for 2015-16, thus allowing its findings to be factored into my determination of how funding is allocated to bodies within the health and social care system. So basically, we're talking a three or four month period, which is extremely demanding. But I think before we come back to this House with our views on the budget for the HSC for the incoming year, we have to be able to stand over the levels of administration. And if there are too many layers of administration, we need to be making proposals to deal with that. But I would rem remind members that administration is 90 per cent personnel. The vast majority of costs involved in administration are people at their desks on the ground carrying this out. So if you were to make any radical change in administration, that means voluntary redundancies. So therefore, we have to have some system in place that allows that to happen. Because even if the Permanent Secretary's report recommended a certain number of, a lower number of staff, it would be three years before we'd make any savings if we made staff voluntarily redundant because we'd have to pay them their packages. So that's the difficulties we find, particularly administration. It is not the quick fix that most people think it is, because under the present civil service arrangements and, and trust arrangements, it is a very hard, difficult and expensive thing to do to ask people to leave. And I call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Speaker, uh, Minister, I'm sure you will be aware of people who actually did take their package and then was re-employed within a matter of days, perhaps in a very similar type of job. So, Minister, can you assure the House that in any uh, look at any organisation or structural change within the staffing, that it will look across all of the arms, length bodies and indeed the trust, the board and the department to ensure that there's no duplication of service provision? Well, uh, the Permanent Secretary's uh, study is right across the board, as it were, uh, th through all, all the organisations. But I would say to her that three years ago, the Health Committee decided to look at the administrative costs of the five trusts. And we went in with great enthusiasm at the time, I remember, was the chair, expecting to find that there was vast layers of administration that we could take out of the system. When we actually looked at the figures, it just wasn't as it seemed. And indeed, I think we came up with a figure of 4.1% as the average administrative expenses of the five trusts. That compared very favourably with other trusts in the United Kingdom and indeed throughout Europe. So there wasn't the huge savings we had anticipated. And remember that we are continue to pile on extra responsibilities, for instance, to transforming your care. Somebody has to deliver uh, those, those uh, ch fundamental changes in the structure of health service provision. It can't be done by volunteers. So therefore, I'm content that in many cases we have the right number, but equally, I am certain that the Permanent Secretary will reveal areas where uh, the savings can be made. But even if those are radical, they will not meet the f fundamental shortfall that we have next year with the recurring for £160 million worth of unmet need. And we have no money, which will require about £110 million for the development of new services. Administration expenses are not the golden bullet here. They're not the savings that can bring about a radical increase in the resources available. We're going to have to look at much more fundamental issues than that. Dr. Alistair MacDonald. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number five, please. I thank the Honourable Member for South Belfast for asking this question because it's very topical and I think one uh, that does require a public airing. I accept that many of the savings proposals that required to be implemented to secure financial ba balance in 2014-15 are counter-strategic. However, they represent those measures that are capable of being delivered on the ground within the remaining months of the financial year. I would not normally support such measures, but there simply are a limited number of areas where cash savings can be extracted from the system at short notice, and indeed I mentioned those earlier. Many of the pressures in 14-15 are also being addressed through non-recurrent means, such as monitoring round funding, which means that we roll forward those unmet needs into 15-16, and those are going to have to be addressed next year. I don't think members really understand that if you get £60 million in the October monitoring round to meet needs, that £60 million doesn't continue into the following year. It meets the need for that financial year, and then you start from scratch the following year trying to find out more resources to meet the same £60 million in that year. The draft budget for 2015-16 is currently out for consultation. 
But as things stand, my department will need to deliver challenging efficiency savings of £160 million in order to meet the existing costs of service provision. I have to apologise that we are almost out of time for listed questions, but if you present your supplementary, it will receive a, a written answer. Thank you. Could I ask the Minister for Health and Social Services that following the, chan following the Chancellor's recent announcement of additional funds, will he now be undertaking a fundamental review of contingency plans within the various trusts? We now out of time, and uh, that ends the period for listed questions. Uh, we now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. William Humphrey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers so far. Can I ask the Minister if he supports Organ Donation Day, which will take place this Thursday? Uh, can I say that I'm a very enthusiastic supporter of the Organ Discussion Day, which is due to be held on the 11th of December? I think this, this is a, a tremendous idea, uh, and indeed I was delighted to be at the launch of this last week. This is part of our Speak Up and Save a Life campaign for organ donation, which encourages people to talk to family and friends about their organ donation wishes. And what I'm urging everyone who's a member of this assembly and anyone who is, who is listening to this is on the 11th of December is to have that discussion with their family. And if you're minded to leave your organs for donation to help others, make that decision very clear to your family so that should the worst situation occur, they are very clear as to your decision. And I'll just leave the example of the young gentleman from Coal Island who died in tragic circumstances in a car accident several years ago. He had made his wishes clear to his family and six of his organs were taken for donation and two of those saved lives and four of the organs enhanced life. It was a traumatic situation for his family but at least they had some reassurance of knowing that the loss of their loved one had meant so much to many others. Mr. Humphrey for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for his answer. Can I also then further ask the Minister what does he consider has been the progress that's been made by the recent PHA um, public information campaign? I'm delighted to say that new registrations added to the organ donor register for residents in Northern Ireland increased by 1,300 in the last 12 months. At the end of September 2014, we have 597. 1,144 people registered on the organ donor register, including myself, an increase of more than 100,000 compared to five years ago. So real progress is being made, and I would thank those people who have made the decision, who have who've allowed their name to be entered on the register, but could also say to, to all of those people and to those who have not registered, even if you're not registered, make your views known to your family now, that if the worst happens, you can provide life to others. So therefore, progress has been made, but we still have a lot to do because there are still people dying needlessly in Northern Ireland because a donor is not available, and we have to do everything we can to overcome that situation. Thank you. Maeve McLaughlin. Um, given the recent um, public uh, criticism um, around the respite facility for learning disabilities at the cottage, cottage uh, care facility in Derry, can the minister outline how he proposes to deal with this proposed cut in vital service? I am very aware of the situation with the cottage in Londonderry. Indeed, I have been lobbied by several MLAs, and indeed I am having a meeting this afternoon, an emergency meeting with, with MLAs led by Mark H. Durkin to discuss this very important issue. As, as the member will know, it is a six-bedded unit that provides regular short-term respite for children aged 5 to 18 years with a varying degrees of learning disability and associated conditions. And, and the Honourable Member for East London Derry, Mr Campbell, has paid tribute for the work that undertaken there. And the Western Trust has advised that the nature of respite provision to families uh, is, has, has, is changing and the new, new provision needs to be made to make personalised provision to meet specific and unique needs. And to ensure this, the Trust has to, to make certain that these services are designed accordingly and coupled with providing services within the commissioned level of funding and the increase in demand, the Trust is reviewing its respite services. Uh, I am aware that this is a very difficult issue in the North West and there is a lot of folk concerned. It is something that I only became aware of very, very recently. I am very keen to, to hear the views of MLAs, including herself as a representative for FOIL, on this issue. So I see today's meeting as being the first of several dealing with this very important issue. For supplementary. 
Carmel. Good and I thank the Minister. Um, I wasn't aware of the meeting, but I'll certainly take the opportunity to attend now. Uh, but can, can, I, can I say that the Trust indicated in the meeting to myself on Thursday that the savings from such a reduction was only in the region of thirty or forty thousand pounds, um, quite minimal savings on, on, on the scheme of things. Could, could I suggest then, in light of that and in the upheaval that it proposes to cause for families and, and uh, their family member, will the Minister now halt the decision to reduce the service? First of all, uh, maybe I don't know whether the lady's been invited or not, but I'm entirely in the hands of those who have called for the meeting. Uh, she may be aware the cottage is a six-bedroom facility, but it only has four beds, uh, which are deemed suitable for those children with complex needs. Uh, Avalon House, uh, which is an alternative provision, has an eight-bed uh, facility. Uh, the Trust is consulting with staff currently at the cottages, and this consultation will end on the 17th of December. So, therefore, it would not be proper for me to make any views known about the service, apart from the fact that many have indicated that there are high levels of satisfaction with it. And then uh, the Trust will also be engaging with families on an individual basis. Over uh, has been engaging with families over the past week. So, we're very much in that very important consultation period. Now that it has been drawn to my attention by quite a few members, I, I will take a personal interest in it. But, as I say, at the end of the day, it is the Trust's decision as to what is best for these highly vulnerable children to make certain that there is the best provision for them. But I thank the member for raising this issue because I think it is very timely. Thank you. And I call Mr Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr Principal. Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister for his assessment of the recent University of Sheffield research into the minimum unit pricing of alcohol, please. Well, I, I think uh, this survey is very, very timely and very important. It shows that alcohol abuse in Northern Ireland is costing this Assembly, this Executive, £900 million a year, that £240 million of that has been levied on the health service, that over 12,000 admissions to our hospitals every year are a direct result of alcohol abuse, and sadly 230 people die as a result of alcohol abuse in Northern Ireland. But what's more shockingly, I think, is the fact that alcohol is now 62 per cent more affordable today than it was 30 years ago. And we simply have to do something about the outbreak of binge drinking in Northern Ireland, which is leading to all these problems. We as a society cannot afford to continue to pick up the bill for alcohol abuse. If I had that £240 million in my budget that's been wasted in dealing with alcohol abuse, then my position would be much stronger today and I wouldn't be having all these painful, painful uh, questions being asked of me. Therefore, I welcome the report. It gives a scientific basis and myself and the Department of Social Development are working together to ensure that we can implement a, a discussion paper to go to the executive and then out for public consultation on minimum unit pricing for Northern Ireland in the same way that my colleagues, colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, Scotland and Wales all looking at the same research have made the same decision. And I call Mr. Douglas for a supplement. Uh, could I thank the Minister for his comprehensive response so far? Um, could the Minister outline the steps that would be required for minimum unit pricing to be introduced in Northern Ireland? The, the uh, licensing of alcohol uh, establishments and licensing policy fall between the Department of Social Development and the Department of Justice. But it's quite clear that it is possible to enact legislation which will make it a condition of one's license, be it an off-license, a supermarket or, or a pub or whatever, that all promotions, all activities which sell alcohol below the minimum price, be it 45 pence or 50 pence or whatever, will be in contravention of their license. And really, when one understands that 20 per cent of the drinkers in Northern Ireland consume 70 per cent of all the alcohols sold. There is something seriously wrong with a society that allows that, and also allows alcohol to be sold significantly cheaper than bottled water, or a two-litre bottle of cider to be sold for two pounds. When that is happening, is it any wonder that our A&Es are clogged up on a Saturday or Sunday night by people who are heavily intoxicated? So therefore, I believe this is a no-brainer. I believe the statistics are out there to show we must do something about this, and I'm depending upon members of this House to back me on a policy that may not be particularly popular, particularly popular, but which will bring real health benefits, social benefits, and of course help our policing service uh, in Northern Ireland. Thank you, and I call Ms. Claire Sugden. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I would ask the Minister, could he give his assessment of the role of the community and voluntary sector to fill the gaps left by a very stretched health and social care public service? I, I think I know the direction in which the Honourable Member is taking this question. I must say she asks, she asks very incisive written questions to me on a very, very regular basis and has ruined many a Saturday night as I've watched Matt's the day trying to deal with her answers. But what I can say is I'm sure she's concerned about the fact that until this week there was no decision made on the funding of voluntary bodies, the 68 that are funded by my department. I'm glad to tell her the decision has now been taken that funding will be reinstated and all of those groups will be paid in exactly the same way as previous years and they can expect to receive the remainder of their payments very soon. So I think that indicates to me that indicates to me just how important I see the role of the voluntary sector within health and social care delivery. Yeah. I call Ms. Claire Sugden for uh, thank a Thank you, and I, I welcome the Minister's response because I too believe that the community and voluntary sector has a place within the public services. Um, what does the Minister feel their role will be within the future to serve in respect of mental health? What I can tell her is that we're going to have a fundamental review of how we fund the voluntary and charitable sector in Northern Ireland. It has grown up over the years with various ad hoc requests for funding. Various ministers, including Mr Majimsey and Mrs De Bruyne, have acceded to various requests, but there has been no coherent policy as to see how that is delivering best value for money on behalf of the state. I believe it's something like over £4 million we give every year. Some of these organisations are large in the sense that they're British-based charities that have Northern Ireland offices and are quite high level of resources. Some are small charities which are entirely based in small communities in Northern Ireland. And we have to decide what is the best use of what is a significant amount of taxpayers' money in order to complement the work that we as a department are doing. So that, I think, is an ongoing uh, part of our policy. But I can assure, as far as this year is concerned, none of the charities will notice any difference. Uh, they are very much uh, going to get um, a, the exactly the same funding they got in 1314. Thank you. Thank you. Back to the theme of alcohol, Minister, we're coming to a, a time of year sadly associated with excessive consumption of alcohol. As you said, it puts great pressure on our accident and emergency departments. Uh, I wonder, would you agree that event organisers and the drinks industry could do more at this time of the year to urge sensible drinking? I think it's an awful pity that we have had to go towards the implementation of a minimum unit price legislation. I think it's very sad that the supermarkets and some club owners haven't voluntarily decided to step in and say, look, enough's enough, we're causing huge problems here. And when we, when we realise that over Christmas, 80% of those reporting to a and &E at weekends after midnight are under the influence of drink, are there because of drink. We can see the huge problems this is having on our health service. And then we wonder why we have difficulty getting middle grade doctors to staff those late night shifts when they have to deal with the abuse that they receive from those who are intoxicated. I would say to pubs, clubs uh, and off licences in supermarkets, why don't you get your act together now and introduce a voluntary minimum using pricing structure? Get together so that no one's being undercut and try and act responsibly, rather than sending lots and lots of mainly young people out on a Saturday night with vast quantities of drink, which they will consume, they will pre-load or need drinking, as it's called, pre-drinking, and then go out to the club or the pub afterwards. That simply cannot be accepted anymore that we allow our young people to destroy their lives by, by binge drinking. We have also a huge increase in liver cancer as a result of that. So to me, it's all pointing in the one direction. Either the industry self-regulates and introduces minimum pricing, or myself and the Department of Social Development are going to do it for them. Mr. Mueller, for a supplement. Thank you, Mila Buihis. Thank, thank you, Minister. Um, I, I know that Tenants NI has uh, voiced support for the minimum pricing on alcohol, and I know many event organisers are very circumspect about how they organise events at this time of year. But uh, I wonder whether you take the opportunity to join me in commending our frontline staff in accident emergency who are put through really hell at this time of year, at a time of celebration, having to deal with people who present uh, drunk at a &E. Indeed, I would concur with that comment. I got a very supportive letter from the Managing Director of Tenants Northern Ireland immediately after the announcement of MIU. And therefore, I would like to think, or MUI, sorry, 
whatever it is. I, <laughs> and that's only in water. But what I would, what, what I would say, to, say to you is that I wish other drink companies were res responsible. But equally, what, who I'm waiting to hear from are the supermarkets. The small number of super supermarkets in Northern Ireland who are still selling alcohol as a loss leader, maybe 35, 40 pence a can. Equally, to those members of our medical staff who will face a very difficult Christmas with people coming in worse for wear, who will take abuse, violence and extreme bad manners. I pay tribute to them. But we as a society have to stop that happening. And all the scientific evidence shows that if you make the price per unit higher, demand and consumption reduces significantly. Unlike cigarettes, where I don't believe that happens. So therefore, we have to do something to protect those health service workers who are having a very difficult time. And if we don't do something, we're going to find it increasingly difficult to keep those a and E's open because staff, particularly nurses, simply will not take on the role of being abused for several hours at the weekend. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of uh, question time. Uh,